that's the entire time here in Ecuador. Uh, we moved to Quito uh, in February of 2022, so just over a year we've been here in the capital city, Quito. So the, we spent our first year and a half in the city of Manta underneath some veteran missionaries, getting some experience, and then the Lord really led and directed our hearts to the city of Quito to begin the church plan we're working with now. Sure. I think we have acclimated well. We're thankful for how the Lord enabled us with the language and making friends and figuring out where things are um, in both cities. Working with the other missionaries was a huge help for us in Manta. And now that we got a little bit more used to the culture and the way things work, um, we ventured out on our own last year in Quito. We knew two people when we came to this city of two and a half million. And um, we've really made it home and we enjoy it very much. That's great. So what have you found to be the most difficult to acclimate to? For me, it's uh, the language is one thing, but... People think differently here, and it, even in teaching and church planting, it, it, take, it has taken me, I've had to slow down and kind of reiterate a lot of things and really take my time with teaching. I, I feel like um, in my mind, I can express something and I expect them to latch onto it, but it's not just the they under they've told me that they understand me fine. It's not the language barrier. It's just the way they process it and the way they think of things. It's totally different in, in my, from my American mindset. And you know, even with interacting with people, you can easily offend them or you can be their best friend, just depending on how you assimilate. And uh, it's just. It, Kind of putting myself in their mindset has been some of the the hardest part. We're thankful for some different opportunities that we've had to participate in community events that has given us more of a, a a full immersion in the culture and enabled us to really see those differences. I, and uh, we're thankful for that. But that's been a, a tough thing, uh, something different that wasn't expected at first. Yeah. How do you? Definitely. Our first year, it was underneath the veteran missionary, but then we took a year of language classes every day, uh, both Ashley and I. And then even now that we're more focused on the ministry, um, I try to listen to myself preaching my, my Sunday sermon and just help, trying to help myself. But when we first moved to Quito, there were things that were hard to express or hard to understand. And you know, we're not there yet. We've still got a long way to go. But, you know, looking back over the past two and a half years, when we first got here, it was really tough. We had some hard times just understanding what people were saying just with the, the speed or the, their accent. But um, in everyday communication, we've learned a lot and been able to kind of take the next step and uh, move forward in the, just being able to teach and preach and, and minister spiritually. Great. So have you ever found somebody walk up to you and after the service and say, you know, this could be said a little bit differently, or are they pretty nice to you? <laughs> they're, they're nice, but they will say that. And so, okay. You know, we, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, this past Sunday, I was really struggling with the word, and I just, had, I just asked them to say it so I could hear it. And, you uh -huh. know, it, you just got to be, be humble about those kind of things and be teachable, and, but it, you know... It's good. Good. It helps a lot. Amen. So, um, how many, how many, on an average, do you have now in the church service? Our average is just over thirty. Okay. Thirty people on a Sunday morning. Great. And of the people that are coming, how many of those were Christians before they met you? The majority, we've had a few that have been saved through our ministry or been able to work with them on, on assurance, but um, for whatever reason, the 
maybe 60, 75 percent of the people have have come in from a Christian background, a non-Catholic background, whether that's broad evangelicalism or uh, we have a couple that have been have kind of separated from the Pentecostal charismatic movement as well. So um, our, our growth has been mixed in that way, but the majority is coming from other churches. Okay. And then how, how many would you say have been saved, you know, since you've been there? When we first got here, we saw a young man saved. He was our first. And then since then, we've had um, three or four additional people get saved. Wow, that's great. So um, could you share some of the testimonies of some of the people that have, it, whether they've been saved since you've been there or even those who have come who have said they've really grown and, you know. Yeah, I'll share one and then Ashley can share one. Um, I, we have a, the, one of the two people that we knew um, before moving here to Quito has been faithful since we opened the doors of the church and really worked in, in bringing their family members. Uh, their nephew is works what was pretty, you know, an unsafe man. He had a, his wife attended most of the time pretty faithfully, and they have two children. And uh, they came to us for marriage counseling. They were going through some tough times. And during our first session there in our house, in our living room, we were able to, I was able to share with him the gospel and he got saved right on in our living room. And so that was a blessing to see how him get saved there. And, but more of encouragement, I think, was to this, this other couple that, that we knew and really we came to, to build the church sort of around them, knowing them and see them really get involved in bringing their family members and then seeing their family members get saved. Amen. as well and that actually has another yeah story. so um there's a lot of venezuelan immigrants here in the city of quito all throughout south america really they've been fleeing venezuela and the difficulties that they have there to look for better opportunities in a better life so there was a solid christian couple that came to um, quito with their two adult children several years ago looking for work, looking for a better opportunity, and they looked for a church to attend. They have a, a several generations of, of Christians in their family, good testimony, looking for a Baptist church to attend in the city of Quito, and they were not able to find one. They've had a lot of interesting experiences visiting churches, bad experiences, and they finally just stopped right around the time of the pandemic when everything shut down anyways. They stopped attending anywhere and just began praying that the Lord would lead them to a solid Baptist church with an American missionary because they received a lot of um, prejudice for being Venezuelan here in Quito. Unfortunately, a few bad Venezuelans have ruined the reputation of the rest of them. And so there's some, some bad feelings towards the Venezuelans from the Ecuadorian people. So they were searching for American missionary that wouldn't have that uh, prejudice against them, that a church that sang traditional hymns out of a hymn book that um, preached the Bible of sound doctrine. And um, they were traveling on the bus one day and they looked out the window and saw our church sign just several months ago, maybe six months ago now. And um, they said, we're going to try that church out on Sunday morning. And they came in the doors and they've been faithful ever since they joined the church. Um, they've been an important part of helping teach and train and um, help us with our doctrinal statement and, and all of those kind of foundational things. Um, and it was really exciting for us to hear that we were an answer to their prayer. Obviously, it was the Lord who who worked out those details. But the time that they started praying, around the time they started praying for a solid Baptist church to be found in their city, the Lord started laying Quito in our heart. And it was, um, you know, all through the pandemic, they had to wait. And we waited for on the Lord's timing as well and to finish language school. But um, the Lord allowed our paths to cross, and, and they're a huge encouragement to us. And we're just grateful that um, we can be uh, an encouragement to them by giving them a place to um, 
a, a church home. So that's another testimony that's an exciting, exciting one for us. That's wonderful to have another couple that can be almost like partners in the ministry there. That's such an encouragement, and that's, that's wonderful. We're glad to hear that. Um, how, where are, are there any other missionaries close to you? Or, go ahead. We're the only one in the, the metro area, the north metro area of Quito, the closest one. More in the suburbs, uh, about a half hour away. Okay. So would there be any other churches near you that are even maybe conservative evangelical or or anything like that? We have a, a, some Southern Baptist churches in our area. Um, there's really not a lot. Uh, yeah. Mostly Catholic. The, there's a couple of Protestant churches, but um, nothing that would be real close to where we were at, where we're at. Okay, great. Any questions that you all have? Any? What's your favorite? What's Weston's favorite thing to do in Ecuador? You answer. Okay, he's feeling shy right now, but his favorite thing to do is ride the bus, right, Weston? The public transportation, most of the city uses public transportation. It costs 35 cents. We have a car um, for safety and for ease of getting around, but Weston loves to ride the public bus. So when we have a free afternoon, him and Mark especially go out and ride the bus. <laughs> and I'm assuming that Weston pays for it out of his allowance. <laughs> <laughs> certainly could. could. <laughs> it's a pretty affordable activity. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Going so, all over the city on public transportation. It's really helped us kind of get around and know our way around. And, and it's at times enjoyable. It's an experience. <laughs> so have, have you, do you cook some of the foods from the culture there? Or are you mainly American in your food right now too? We love to try new things. And I make something Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian style, maybe once a week. And I love learning new things, or we try new things at restaurants. But we have a lot of American products available too. And so I say the majority of what we eat at home is a little more American style. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Jerry? Did you hear that? We did. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there is no no restrictions on us in that way. The only logistically, it's hard to do door to door because we're in a third world country. Everybody has big bars and electric fences and or or twenty four seven guards um, in guarding their apartment building or or their house. And so we, what we found is that if we do sort of like a little route or, or sit on a street corner or go to a public park, we can have a lot more conversations with people. And that's one of our, been one of our better ways of doing outreach is uh, just street evangelism. And the Lord is blessed with just about every week a visitor that got um, a flyer or a tract uh, from our Saturday evangelism and visitation time attends the, the following day or, or a, a Sunday. There's always a visitor that, that, re that visits because of that time. People don't really answer the door because it's not safe or it's Saturday morning and they're sleeping in or they just don't want to be bothered. So they don't answer the door. But if you see them on the street, they'll talk to you. Hmm. Anybody else? Okay. How does Ecuadorian money compare to American money? That's a great question because we use the U.S. dollar. So all our money is the same money that you have. And uh, <laughs> that we, there are a couple of different coins, but the country switched over to the U.S. dollar in 2010, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. And so our support is paid in U.S. dollars. Thank you guys for supporting us uh, for the past three years. And uh, we have no exchange rates, no currency, 
changes to make. And so it's been a real blessing for us. Wow. Anybody else? Tim. What kind of jobs do your, your church people have and what's prominent in the area? Sure. We have, in terms of like middle class, upper class, we have everybody from uh, just real low income that will sell just water bottles on a street corner um, and just try to make $10 a day, basically unemployed, all the way up to people that are involved in uh, the oil industry, which would be the, the largest paychecks, the largest salaries here in Ecuador would be involved with uh, oil. And so we have a big mix of that in our church. The majority would be more informal, informal selling, whether it's just something on a street corner or they have a fruit stand or something like that. We have some house cleaners, people that uh, work for other people in their house. Um, uh, the flower industry, we had, had some people involved in that, flower, fresh cut flowers. Uh, Ecuador exports a lot of those. And so there's a lot of flower, flower people involved in the flower industry. Um, uh, of course, our church being in a metropolitan area, we have a big mix of people. When you have a major city, you have all those other cottage industries and all the, the other, you know, places where people find jobs, you know, working at the supermarket, a factory, you know, different teachers uh, would all be people that work in, you know, the jobs that are represented by our church. Okay. Uh, are you still looking for another location for your church building? We're definitely praying about it because uh, there's a second floor available above our meeting space now that this coming Sunday, I'm going to do a little tour with the church people to show them that uh, as a prayer burden. But you, our space is kind of getting small uh, for the people that we've we're, that are attending pretty regularly with that 30 people we can fit probably 45 50 in there um, without it getting too uncomfortable but um, you know for our Christmas program and our Easter program we had 45 people plus so uh, you know there's those big events when people are bringing their visitors that's when we really started feeling the pinch and uh, now as we're growing uh, we are looking for a place we're just trying to trust the Lord and see where he leads us, but we're looking more towards moving our nursery and our Sunday school rooms upstairs and then opening up some of the walls we put up to make those spaces in that lower, that first floor um, meeting room and, and then having the capacity of up to 80 people there. What would your typical week look like as far as ministry in your church? Sure really starts on Tuesday. You know, the, today's our, our day off since Saturday and Sunday are so full with um, ministry opportunities and it's a blessing to take a day as a family. And uh, Tuesday we start during the morning it, between Ashley and I, usually just about every day we have a family or two or a person or two coming over to our house and we uh, do a one-on-one -on -one Bible study um, with them. Wednesdays I do a lot of the the just the, the church administration stuff, um, you know, depositing the offerings and making all the writing to our visitors that, that visited on Sunday and just trying to make sure that we're ready to go um, paperwork wise for everything throughout the week. And then uh, Thursday is our another big ministry day for us because we have our midweek service. So right now we're just doing a small group Bible study. Uh, we've been doing that about a year. And it's worked out well for us. So Thursday, I get to church in late early afternoon, and we have a, uh, a couple of one-on-one -on -one counseling um, opportunities for with some men that have some needs in our church. And um, then in the evening, we have our, our midweek meeting time. Friday is my sermon prep, and, and usually have a Bible study or two in the morning. And uh, Saturday, we're doing evangelism in the morning from... We have a small prayer meeting, 10.30, and then uh, go out and, and do evangelism until about lunchtime. And then Sunday, of course, we have uh, Sunday school, Sunday morning service, and then uh, Sunday evening service at 5, 5 o'clock. Wonderful. One Saturday a month is ladies' Bible study. One Saturday a month is men. And one Saturday a month is a young adult fellowship time with a challenge, games food um so 
our Saturdays get filled up quickly as well. And then Weston goes to uh, preschool Monday through Friday in the morning to help him be exposed to Spanish, to make friends and contacts in the community. And um, he's really enjoying that and he's really doing really well with Spanish. Next year, we'll, or in the fall, I should say, we'll start uh, kindergarten with him at home and Brooklyn will attend the preschool for one year to improve her Spanish as well. Good, very good. Anybody else? All right. Do they have what? Oh. She, uh, she asked, what are the stores like there, and do you have thrift stores there, like Goodwill or? Sure. Um, we have everything from a very modern supermarket with imported goods from Europe and the United States to an open-air market with fruits, vegetables, meat, um, and produce, um, dairy items like eggs, including the goats standing there that you can get fresh goat's milk from. So we have all of that from the very modern down to the very third world kind of. Um, and then we um, don't have many thrift stores, but every once in a while you'll come across a secondhand shop. It's all secondhand items from the United States. The people here use things until they're absolutely past using and or they donate them to like through a church or to a a poor person, a homeless person they see on the street. So there's a few secondhand stores, but they're all they went to the United States. Someone went to the United States, bought it at Goodwill in the United States, and brought it back here to sell for double the price. <laughs> Oh, because American brands and American products are very desirable. Everyone wants to be dressed in American brands. Huh. Anybody else? Okay. Well, very good. What are some prayer requests that maybe that we could be praying better for you, more specifically for you? Sure. Kind of like what I mentioned earlier, pray for us on this building decision that we just, the Lord would just lead us to exactly uh, the right thing to do. Uh, for this church plant, and um, that also the, the that it would be a decision. It's my personal burden that it would be a decision made by uh, our people. And um, of course, I'm going to lead and guide as as best as I can as their pastor and church planter. But um, you know, we're we're church planters working ourselves out of a job, so I want them to have some ownership there and uh, pray for that whole decision. And then our ministry. Uh, soul saved primarily and then of course the ones that the lord leads our way are certainly uh have their needs and so the lord pray that the lord would use us and that his word would have free course through our lives um our ministry would be a blessing uh to them and they would grow in strength and spiritually um anything else I think that so we have several people in our church facing some trials and um, just really needing to grow in their walk with the Lord through this time that the Lord is leading them through and um, apply the truth of God's word to their daily life. So just for spiritual growth, I'd say for the ones that God has brought to us that we're trying to um, help through different trials of health, um, employment, family difficulties, things like that. All right, well, why don't we close with a word of prayer and um, appreciate so much your time tonight. It's been a blessing and it's made our missions conference a little more special. So, uh, we're, Thank you for having us. Uh, Thank you, guys. We're encouraged to see your prayer letters every time. So, all right. Father, we thank you for the accurates. Uh, Lord, thank you for how you are building a church there in Quito, uh, Ecuador, and we pray for Mark and Ashley. Help them, Lord, as parents, and uh, Lord, they don't have a lot of people to help with their children, but I thank you that uh, you've given them a real burden there, and 
children are such an asset to building a ministry as they see uh, the pastor's home uh, as a model. And I pray, Lord, that you'll just give them great uh, success and blessing upon their children. And I pray as they're looking for this uh, location that you would uh, give Brother Mark peace about where you would have them and that their church would be united about it and begin to really uh, invest in that so that they could uh, continue to grow both in number and spiritually. We pray that you'll give them souls. Lord, they're are souls everywhere that need Christ, and we thank you for the burden that you've given them for those there in Ecuador. And so we ask that you will continue to build that up. Keep them safe and keep them, uh, Lord, fervent for the work that you've given them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye, Weston. Fifty, and we'll just sing one verse of channels only. Blessed Master, but with all Thy wondrous power flowing through us, Thou canst use us every day and every hour. Let's stand as we sing. Five fifty. How I praise Thee, precious Savior, that Thy love laid hold of me. Thou hast saved. And cleansed and filled me that I might thy channel be. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. And then you can be seated. Before our message, it's a privilege to have Rachel Houts uh, on a borrowed cello play uh, special for us tonight. Emma loaned her cello. Is that right? Is it Emma's? Okay. Very good.
right now we'll have Brother Aaron come and give us the message tonight. Believe it or not, I very rarely get to hear my wife play the cello. Um, as you can tell, it's a large instrument, and when it is packaged safely in a case, it's an even larger item to carry around. So we, we are unable to, to travel with her cello. Uh, it was a delight for her to be able to uh, borrow this cello and play. Um, it's my favorite instrument to hear her play. So. I enjoyed it. If you were reading the lines on the screen, uh, Lift High the Cross was the hymn that she played. And the fourth verse, the last two lines say, Let all the earth proclaim his glorious praise. And I believe the hymn writer is talking about general revelation. And then the last line is, Let all who know him, that's referring to, to us, God's people, let all who know him now their voices raise. And this really is the goal of many missions conferences is to challenge all of us to make our voices more usable, uh, to challenge us to proclaim the praises of our Lord. Well, if you would please take out your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. We will begin in Matthew chapter 5. I do want to mention briefly on our table, <clears throat> again, is an email sign up, uh, but we have little booklets that are free for you to take. Uh, the title is Pray 938. And when the speaker last night, John Crocker, gave his message on Matthew 938, uh, I, was, I struggled at first a little bit because I'm preaching on Matthew 938 tomorrow night. And it really, to me, to hear him preach, the Lord solidified in my mind, there may be someone here who needs to hear that twice. Um, it's not going to be word for word, obviously. The Lord worked this out for a purpose. But on our table, our, our mission board put together these little booklets, and they are very purposeful in, in giving us a tool to make Matthew 9.38 um, part of our lives. So if you would please take one of those booklets, it's prayer goals, praying for more laborers that the Lord would send them. And then tomorrow night, again, we'll look at that passage. But tonight, we will look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Yesterday morning, we considered Matthew 16 and the promise of our Lord to build his church and, and kind of a a general call for, for all of us to be more involved with that. We're going to get a little bit more specific tonight and then a little bit more specific tomorrow night. But tonight we're going to look at two metaphors that our Lord used to call us to a certain lifestyle. If you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we all are. It's the most famous sermon that has ever been preached. Verses 3 through 10 the Lord speaks what we, what we call the Beatitudes, blessed statements, and he uses eight statements to describe a Christian's life and what it's going to look like. And then verses 11 and 12, he starts to, to change the topic into more uh, looking towards the world and, and what we're going to be like when we are involved with the world. And then verse 13, Jesus is going to begin applying a Christian's lifestyle to the world and what we are supposed to be like. How do we take our faith and apply it to the world? Verse 13 of Matthew 5, you are the salt of the earth. And those are the only words we're going to consider right now. Think with me, Jesus is saying you are something. We are something. He's not challenging us to be something. He's not saying you need to be the salt of the earth. He's saying you are the salt of the earth. Who's he talking to? Well, the beginning of the chapter, verse 1 of Matthew 5, seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So it, it seems like he's preaching to his disciples. 
is this the group of 12 men that, that we typically think of? Well, if you turn back to chapter 4, just a few verses before our passage in verse 18, Jesus calls his first two disciples, two brothers, Peter and Andrew. A few verses later, he calls James and John. Those are the only four men that Matthew records are his, what we would typically call disciples when he preaches this sermon. It's a little unclear with the other Gospels how many of these men have actually been called when he preaches the sermon. So is he talking to just these four men? or however many disciples he's called to this point? Or is he talking to a large gathering? Well, turn to the end of the sermon. In the end of chapter 7 of Matthew. Chapter 7, verse 28 says, So it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished. So this is a group. The beginning of chapter 8, he came down from the mountain and great multitudes followed him. He's preaching not just to the few disciples that he has, he's he's preaching to a large group of people. And in these Beatitudes, we realize that he's speaking to Christians. So when he says, you are the salt of the earth, he's, he's speaking to you and he's speaking to me. Okay, so Christ calls us salt we're going to look at how we're supposed to be salt in two ways. How are we supposed to be salt? When Jesus said these words, these people would have understood this to mean one thing. How was salt used in the time of Jesus? Where he preached this sermon was on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee, outside of a city called Magdala. We know Mary Magdalene, she was from this town. Jesus preached on the mountain outside of Magdala. A pastor friend of mine showed me some pictures a few months ago that he took while he went to Magdala. He visited the Holy Land, went to Magdala, and through the city and outside of the city, they found these little caves. And the picture looked like maybe two people could fit inside this little hole in the ground. And what they would use these holes in the ground for is to preserve meat. They would take fish, right, being right on the Sea of Galilee. All of the, If you look on a map in the back of your Bible and you look up the Sea of Galilee, there are, there are little cities all around the Sea of Galilee. And many of these cities were fishing towns. Well, how did they preserve their fish? They didn't have refrigeration. Uh, they didn't have freezers. They didn't have vacuum sealing, Okay. They preserved their fish with salt. And Magdala was known for having these big pillars of salt that people would use to put their meat inside these caves and bury them in salt to preserve them. So where Jesus was speaking, as soon as he said, you are the salt of the earth, the people would have thought, a preservative? What does that tell me? that our Lord views the world as. What needs a a preservative? Something that's decaying. And we know from Romans 1 that, that God views the world as decaying, sinful, spiritually dead. So he challenges us to be salt. When we were in Alaska, thankfully we were there during salmon season. We were able to see how the natives catch and eat their salmon. And these people catch large amounts of salmon at one time because they freeze all of it, they can it, they smoke it, and they live off of this year-round. One of the ways that they would prepare their salmon is to use a brine. Some of you have probably used a brine with some meat. And to watch the missionary prepare the brine like a lot of the natives do, he he gets a big tote and puts a lot of water in it, a lot of vinegar, and a lot of salt. And then the fish gets dumped in this big tub, and they soak there for several hours. I think it was 12 hours he let them sit in there. And then they go in the smokehouse, they dry out, they get smoked, and, and then they can them. What does the brine do? Well, it cures it. When people use salt to preserve food, how do they apply it? Well, 
they don't apply it like sometimes we apply ourselves to the world. They don't get this, they don't get a cookie sheet and lay the meat on the cookie sheet and very gently put that above some salt that's sprinkled on the table. These people completely submerged their meat into the salt. So as a preservative, how do we apply ourselves to the world? One of the things that makes our Lord one of the greatest, the greatest preacher who ever walked the earth was how quickly he applied what he preached. Again, please turn with me to the end after the sermon in Matthew chapter 8. How does Jesus apply himself as salt? He's preaching to the people. He's saying, you are salt. And as soon as he finishes this sermon, we're going to see him practice this. Chapter 8, verse 1. When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came. A walking body of decaying flesh. A leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. What does Jesus do? What does he do when a highly contagious man walks up to him? People ran from these people. He reached out and he touched his flesh. He touched his body. The people he just preached to saw this happen. Friends, sometimes this is how we must apply ourselves to the world as salt. Now, we all understand that this looks like something and doesn't look like something else. In John chapter 17, the Lord prays for Christians. And he prays, he confesses to the Lord that yes, the world will hate us. And there's a reason why they hate us. Why is that? What does Jesus say? He says, the world hates us because we are not of the world. We do need to be careful how we touch the world. But there is a sense where we need to be very heavily involved in the lives of unsaved people. Sometimes, if I can be very practical, sometimes that looks like instead of handing somebody a track, stopping and talking through that track with them learning a little bit about them. Many times we have to move on, and it's just a grab-and-go, literally, scenario. But sometimes we do, we must be more involved with people, as Christ was, and we need to touch their lives. We don't typically view salt as a preservative, do we? How do we view salt today? A very cheap seasoning. You go to any restaurant, it's sitting on the table, it's free to use. And probably if you emptied the whole salt shaker on your food, they wouldn't charge you any extra. You can buy it at gas stations. Any grocery store sells salt. We all have it in our cupboards. We use it in many things. And this still applies to us as a seasoning. How how are we supposed to apply ourselves to a world as a seasoning? A couple months ago, we were at a church in Ohio, and we presented on a Wednesday evening. Thursday morning, we got up. We were in the home of the family from the church we were staying with. They fixed us breakfast, and uh, we were sitting at the table. It was just Anna and myself at the table. I think Rachel and the other two were on their way. The, the, The food was served to Anna and I. We were sitting there, and Anna and James are both at this stage. We're all familiar with this, where... They want to do a lot of things themselves. And, you know, as parents, we, 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 seek, we, we try to be wise in what we let them do themselves. And many times it's just it is way faster and it's actually better for us to say, no, just, just let me do it. I'll take care of it. You'll figure it out when you're older. Well, we were sitting at a table, and before we ate, Anna was, was unloading on the lady all these things that she's been able to do herself. And she, she's talking to the lady about this. She said, I can do this by myself. I can put my shoes on by myself. I can brush my teeth by myself. And then she asks, she sees me put a little bit of salt on my food. And she says, Daddy, can I have some salt? I said, yeah. 
I go to put it on. She says, can I please do it myself? And, and I have never, we, we've never, at this point, never let her salt her own food because, you know, we don't want to put too much on it. It's way quicker for us to put it on and move on with the meal. But I got this, this fatherly sense that she needed to do this herself. She was trying to impress this lady. So I gave her the salt shaker. Mindlessly, we all put salt on our food. And, and we, it's called a salt shaker because we shake it out. Okay? Well, she didn't know that. So she grabs the salt and she, she just holds it there. And the salt is pouring on her food. And she has this pile of salt on her food. So I reach over, I stop her, I put it back, I said, I, that's definitely enough. And I was surprised that she didn't ask for another plate, she took a bite. What do you think her first reaction was when she took a bite? And, and she didn't spit it out, she chewed it, she swallowed it. What do you think her first reaction was? She grabbed her drink and she took a big gulp because she was thirsty. If we are applying ourselves as Christians like salt as a seasoning to the world, we should cause them to thirst for something. Some of you may have been saved out of a life of, of seeking something, a flavor in this world. We fill our lives with all of these seasonings, all of these things we find in our cupboard, but nothing can take the place of salt. And once again, Jesus shows us this very clearly. Turn with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter 4. We come to a very special time in the life of Christ when, where he's at Jacob's well. And who's there with him? A woman, Samaria. Genesis, uh, John chapter 4. We know the story. A woman's at the well. Jesus comes, commands her to give her water. Verse 6, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Since we know the story, I'm not going to read through all of this. But in verse 10, he, he gives her the idea of living water. Verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water, the water from the well, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. She didn't quite understand what Jesus was talking about yet. But throughout this passage, she comes to learn, Jesus begins telling her things that nobody else knows. She perceives him to be a prophet. And then, verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes... He will tell us all things. Verse 26, so special. Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. I am the Messiah. We know the rest of the story. She is extremely excited. What does she do? She runs down back to the city and she begins telling people, this guy back up at the well, started telling me all these things. He's the Messiah. Then drop down to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him. Why? Because of the word of the woman who testified. What happened in the life of this Samaritan woman? She had a thirst. The thirst was quenched. And she went, notice what it says in verse 39, the word of the woman who testified. She testified of a quenched thirst in her life. What do we, what do, we do as salt, like a seasoning to the world? We testify to them, don't we? 
we testify the word to them. Many times, we are unable to have long conversations with people. So we testify to them in how we live. We live a certain way. The world is, is reaching, it's grabbing, it's, not, it, it's thirsty all the time, it's trying to get more. Is that how we look to them? There's a story about a lawyer, a very successful lawyer, who finally at one point he, he reached a financial goal where he was able to purchase his dream car, a convertible BMW. His first drive off of the lot, a few miles down the road, he enters an intersection and a lady runs a light and she swerves to try and miss him, but she ends up running into him at an angle, shearing off the door, the driver's door, and crashing into him. A bunch of people, you know, they show up, they respond. The man jumps out and he, he is so mad. He just bought his dream car. And he starts yelling, my beamer, my beamer. This crazy lady just ruined my beamer. A man walked up to him who responded and said, uh, Sir, look at your arm. He looks at his arm and it's gone. He lost his arm. He said, My Rolex! <laughs> Sometimes, my friends, if, if we aren't careful, we can be like this man. And, and the world may actually see us like this. They may actually look at us and say, yeah, that's the guy who has great goals and wishes financially. Uh, that's the guy that just, that's just got all this new stuff. He, that's all he talks about. That's all, all they talk about. We need to be careful to make sure the world sees us as people whose thirst is quenched. And when they see that contentment in our lives, it will cause them to be thirsty. How can we be used as seasoning? Psalm 119, verse 72, David says, The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. The Holy Spirit uses his word to thirst our quench, to quench our thirst. When we go to the world, when we, when we talk to unsaved per people, this is what we have to offer them. It's the truths in this word that the Holy Spirit uses to quench thirsting. Look at me with the rest of the verse, please. Back in Matthew chapter 5, we only read the first line. Matthew chapter 5, back at verse 13, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor... How shall it be seasoned? Jesus is applying salt as a seasoning. It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. What good am I to Christ if my life has no effect on people around me who are decaying spiritually? And just a final thought. We have one more illustration to go light. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. Again, Jesus is not commanding us to do something. He's saying you are something. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Quickly, how, how are we light? If you think about your New Testaments, we read several times about light. And usually it's with a capital L referring to who? Referring to Christ. The Gospel of John lists Christ as being light several times, over 20 times. Jesus as light. John 8, verse 12, after dealing with an adulterous woman before Pharisees, claims that he's the light of the world. Chapter 9, after healing a blind man, the first time Jesus puts a time frame on light, Jesus talks about him being a light while he's here on earth. I like to think of this as some of you have had these little stars that you stick on your ceiling as kids. Maybe some adults still use those. I don't know. But I had them as I was a kid, these glow-in-the-dark stars that you put on your ceiling with sticky tack. When we were kids, we used blue sticky tack, and I don't 
know why, because it's still there to this day in my old bedroom, my parents' house. But you know what it's like to have these, these stars up in your wall, you turn the lights off and they glow. Well, what happens after a week or two weeks and you turn your lights off, they begin to lose their, their brightness, don't they? We had a couple that would fall off, we'd just throw them in our toy box. A couple years later, we would find them, pull them out, and they don't glow anymore. What, what can you do to bring that glow back? If you take a flashlight, maybe you've tried this, you take that star and you put the light on that star and hold it there, it'll glow again. It, it, it's like it recharges it. That's a good illustration of what we are like as lights. We are not the light of the world. We reflect the light of Christ. What light do we have for unbelievers? Again, Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We pray that people come to the light and become children of light because it's the light of the word, again, that we have to offer these people. We go to them. We talk with them about the gospel like the Lady of Samaria, we testify to them about a, a quenched thirst. And by the grace of God, he uses us as salt and light as we become more and more willing to be used as salt and light. Father, thank you so much again for giving us your word and that your word commands us defines us and challenges us to live a certain way. Our prayer, all of us tonight, is that you would give us a willing spirit and that our, our hearts would be completely devoted to you and that we would truly be lights in a dark world set on a hill, set apart to reflect your holiness and complete separation from sin. We ask that we would be good stewards of the eternal life that you've given us while we remain in a physical form here on this earth. We pray in your son's name. Amen.